you were taught the Bada Karata Sutta, but it was such a valuable sutta. It's the only one in 152 suttas that is in the book four times in a row. Now tell me why, if it wasn't important. Why do you bother to put the same exact sutta there and you're telling a different person each time, but it's the same exact sutta. One is a little bit more detailed than the first and second and third, but the, they're actually the same thing with the same exact prose written there. And it's, it's the same. So if this wasn't important, why would they bother to do that? Look at in, in um, Samyutta Nikaya, there's tons of places where Bhikkhu Bodhi had a sutta that was said like that four times or five times in a row. And what did he do with it? Did you ever look in the Samyutta Kaya and see? He just said the, the name of it to so-and-so with a dot, 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 and then the name of the next person with a dot, 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 and the name of the next person with a dot, 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 and their little numbers, and that's all. On the, on the page after he gives gives it one time. But they didn't do that here. So they must have believed what I believe. This is so important. And when you teach it at the beginning of a retreat, it is like nobody has ever said to these people directly. No, all two, it was 20 people at that night when we did that sutta. Nobody's ever said to them before, you have a right to live in the present moment of clear mind in the present time. You have a right to get in that car and stay there through your whole entire life. Nobody had ever said that to them. Nobody ever told them there was such a thing as that. That should be told to every child in school, every kid in high school before they go to college. Every one of them should know about this. Why is, how is the depression work? Because I start thinking about this past and the past is gone. I mean, this is not, this is not space math. This is a real serious thing. This whole thing of depression that's happening worldwide. And one of the things that can straighten it out is just having to spend a little bit of time with one little set of pros and that's all. Let not a person revive the past or on the future hold his hopes. For the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. And then you talk about the past and you talk about the future, but you let them talk about it. You ask them what it means. And the future has not been reached. And instead, what are they supposed to do? With insight, let him see each presently arisen state. That means your meditation. You watch it, how it works. Let him know that and be sure of it invincibly and unshakably. That's what they're saying. So it gives you something to do, not just telling you, but I'm telling you, you can watch it and actually see it and understand the difference between wholesome and unwholesome just by remembering tension and tightness and lightness and clarity of mind. You can remember it even that way. Okay, so the next thing that happened, where am I? Oh dear, I, I left. I, I left 141. Just a second. <laughs> I closed the book and I ran back to 131, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the next piece of this in 141, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Is aging. And I said the aging, right? Now we do the death at 13. Friends, what friends is death? It's the passing of the beings of the various orders. They're passing away, the dissolution, disappearance, dying, completion of time. That's the one we said completion of time fits what we're talking about. And it is the uh, dissolution of the aggregates, the laying down of the body, the laying down of the story. You see the laying down of the story that was the reaction that came plowing into your mind. The laying down of it, the completion, identifying the completion of its time, its past. Yeah. And what, friends, is sorrow? The sorrow, the sorrowing, the sorriness, sorrowfulness, inner sorry, inner sorriness. They really like the word sorry. <laughs> of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state. This is called sorrow. 
That's your sorrow. Now, what is the lamentation? The lamentation is the wail and the lament. The wailing and lamenting, bewailing and lamentation of one who has encountered a misfortune or is affected by some painful state. That is called the lamentation. This is painful state, painful situation, painful body, painful relationship, whatever that's happening. And what, friends, is pain? Bodily pain, bodily discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feeling that's born of bodily contact is called pain. So he he pigeonholed these in the suttas. In he pigeonholed each one. And what, friends, is grief? Here it comes. The mental pain, the mental discomfort, the painful, uncomfortable feeling born of mental contact. This is called grief. So it's not just when somebody's dying. It's not just when somebody has left. It's the grief of anything. And you want to see grief, you go to help in a town where a tornado has happened and half the town has nothing but sticks like the size of toothpicks. Then you get to watch grief. You really see it happen from beginning to end. And it's really terrible. And also when we hear about this um, lamentation, I always kind of laugh about the lamentation because when I was a teenager, I had a lot of wailing and lamenting and oh my goodness, there was a, one expression of renting the clothes and tearing the clothes and bewailing what was happening. And that was just going through a torturous time in my teenage years with different things that were happening at home and around me and also the war and everything and people that I knew dying and stuff like that. It was just really ripped us apart. And what friends is despair, the total, the trouble and despair, the tribulation, the desperation of one who has encountered this misfortune, some misfortune and is affected by a painful state that goes on and on for a period of time. This is called despair. And despair is the lower part of this grief or the lower part of the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, you see, that happens in, in a situation. So when you're looking at this, you see he's looking, examining very close about the death. And we're talking about the death of event. When we look at the dependent origination chart, what we're looking at is the end. But as I said, we want to look at the healing. Let's look at it just again and see whether we can um, see for sure what, how this is working. Okay. I have a seven link working chart. And uh, the reason we call this a, a, seven, a seven link chart is because it goes only from contact feeling over to craving, clinging, habitual tendency, um, and, and birth and aging and death, okay. Um, you know, I always wanna put the A in there, but it seems like everything lopsided, so I left it without an A. <laughs> it's funny, okay. So contact happens and then feeling and then craving and then clinging, then habitual tendencies and then birth and then the aging and death, okay. Now, what I said was the person who is angry, first of all, they don't give birth to the action. And when they don't do that, that's the first step. And so we have this step here as the first step of giving up the action you want to change. You feel it coming up. What do you feel? If you come back here, is it set off by seeing something or a color? Or is it is it set off by an odor? Is it set off by... Um, you know, uh, the feeling of some kind of fabric or some feeling from the air, anything. It can be anything at all. This is really serious with PTSD because in the military, they, something was happening at the point where something bad happened and it sets the person off. If you know what it is, then you can let go and relax and let it go because it is a past thing and you can not come out 
if you catch this arising. And so instead of giving somebody, instead of taking a, a medication to stop the arising of this happening ever at all, you learn how to manage it with, you can learn to manage it, but don't give up any medicine before you know how it's going to work out. You have to test it first to learn how to sense what's happening, how it's operating. So the contact is happening where you see something, a feeling arises, and if it's painful, then it would kick off um, you not liking it. And then what happens is the craving is rising as the painful feeling happens. You launch an opinion right here. You launch an opinion as to um, what is actually happening, okay? That's what you're doing. And then um, you, um, once you personally get involved here at the craving, so what lit the craving, what started the heat of the craving and the tension, what triggered it was me from here to here. As soon as you say, I don't like this, I want this to stop, or I like this, I want to get, keep it going. As soon as you feel the tension of that happening, that is where the heat starts. That is where all of this operates from. And when the heat is happening, so if you're letting go of that, you don't have to go into the aging and death, the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. You don't get there because you let go of it. Now, you let go of it back here. You can feel it happening here. And then the runaway story about why you don't like it. And here you also have place a place where you can cross this one out. The first one is to cross out this one and not have the birth of the reaction happen. I'm not going to react anymore. Bite my lip suck my thumb or whatever it takes, you know, and not react and laugh at the fact that that pushed up from inside. I didn't really want to react, but it pushed. Did you feel it? It was a personal thing because I got involved with it, but say no, and you don't. And then there was no birth. The habitual tendency itself is in the library Sometimes it will be the same one over and over and over again that triggers something. But other times it isn't coming from that way. Other times it can be coming from anything that's in the habitual tendency library. It can go way back to something that happened when you were small or not. It isn't so important to go back and spend time figuring out what it was because those are the causes of the things that happened when you were young we call those frozen needs. That means if you were to try to replace the need that happened back when you were young, you can't do that when you're older. Those people aren't there, nothing's the same. So if you were missing an element of parenthood or something, there's no way that you can replace that. This is what makes it hard for relationships when you're older, when you haven't had that, when you were younger, you have to be careful that you're not just replacing, trying to replace something because you never can. And then it wears the other person out or the person wears you out whichever one happens first, you know, you, you wear each other out, trying to fulfill something that needed to have happened when you were young, that would have changed your life is what you've discovered, but you can't because it's a frozen need in time. It's in the past. So we have to let that go. And if we know what it is, then we've identified it. We're more careful not to get in trouble with that. That's one important thing. But these habitual tendencies are very tricky, you know, because we grab them so fast and jump over and give birth to them. That's what we have to watch out for. Yeah. So do you kind of get the feeling for what is happening with aging and death? Can you relate it to the way that we're talking about examining one event at a time in behavior? Can you do that? Um, I have a, a question. You mentioning PTSD there, and you were talking at one point that uh, you look at the arising, uh, but then there's another point you're saying, 
Well, if someone's got full-blown anger uh, coming up, uh, they work at um, uh, trying not to uh, take that anger into action. Just stop, just stop. So when you're dealing with PTSD, where there may be a very, very strong reaction, um, in your experience, are people able to get, uh, see that they're acting and actually, the, or the inception of action and stop? Or do you work with them more at the inception side? First of all, they have to learn about the movie. See, they don't know about the movie. Okay, mm -hmm. so you, you just said it in a, in a nutshell, you know, full-blown anger arises. That's not what happens. And so mm -hmm. by taking them into the editing room and explaining how anger actually did happen usually fascinates the person when they're out of anger. You know, when, they, when you actually show them what actually happened in an, an episode that occurs, then, then you're actually, now I'll tell you something too, um, with military guys, I've only worked with two of them, but the one thing that struck me because I was a military wife, uh, you know, for many years. And so um, military people are meticulous with instructions, their MOS training for whatever they are in the military was very, very meticulously learned. And they went through all these manuals and everything. And when all of a sudden, you know, when you take them to a doctor, everything's looked at as the, the full-blown anger bursts out and it occurs. This thing just happens, you see, but it's being triggered by what? It's being triggered by what's called re-stimulation which is what I was trying to say. You see, hear, smell, taste, or touch something and bang, it just comes out. And, and this is the, the excuse for not fixing anger in anger management is, but it just happens. Yeah, and then all of a sudden I come along and say, no, it didn't just happen. Well, what happened? And then I draw it on a board and their mouth drops open. And you mean somebody actually looked at this? Yeah, they do. They did look at it and they know this is how all these things happen. So the biggest thing you're doing when you're teaching them this is you are showing them that they're part of a movie. They're caught in a movie and they haven't realized they're in a movie and it has frames. And if you take, let's pretend we go into the editing room and that's the best way to explain it to you and show you the frames frame by frame. But what you're doing to this guy in the military is you're, you're taking him into a tech manual and you're showing him step by step how to do use a piece of equipment just like he's been doing the whole time he was in the military so they can relate to this in a way they can't relate to it if we just say well you know they found a drug that'll just stop all this except the night that you don't take the drug except the night that you run out of it and you are stuck without it then you're down a creek because you still don't understand this doesn't happen to you bang it does not happen that way so when you these guys are really smart and if they've been in the field in any extent working in any number of the of the uh, MOSs for their positions you know They've been using these tech manuals and they go back and tell me, well, that made it so much easier for me to understand. And I just didn't have an opportunity to actually work with more than two of them in the time that I've done it. But I'm convinced this would be tremendously helpful if we just wouldn't succumb to the rumor that everything happens bang, you see, and we pretend that we have secret information and we're gonna show them the way out. That's a bummer. Let's really? put it on the table. This is what's real and this is what's happening to you. And, and you don't know what's happening, but if you did, you're a smart guy and you can do this and work backwards and change the whole process. That's what I'm after seeing happening. Um, when you're saying working backwards, then you're working from the anger back to the cause, getting back to contact and feeling and, and uh, craving. Uh, um, but when they're experiencing uh, their reaction, uh, in your experience, are they able to um, bring that awareness at the point of uh, when they're feeling overwhelmed? Or the answer, yeah, my solution for them when they have a really big bang, okay, is the if they've seen the chart, this is my experience, if, I, if yep. they've seen the chart and had a class on the chart 
and they've been given it and they've had the work, the work, not the whole workshop, but just the chart where you work out the different emotions and show how they happen. Just that little one page. If they've done that, that's in their head now. And the next time this bangs, they're going to, my, I said, the next time this bangs, you have to see that first. So, and you're going to stop doing that. And I can tell you, don't do that. So the only way you cannot do that is at the point where you're just going to go bang is turn around and walk away. Absolutely okay. turn around and walk away and cancel it or burst into laughter. If you've got, if you really have enough of this in your head, burst into laughter. Why? Because laughter cancels the other thing immediately because only one thing can happen with the brain at one time. And laughter immediately canceled that because you can't be laughing and be angry. You can't. It's impossible. So that's your I, first. I that, that is your first stop. You see, your plug in the hole, and and the, the dynamite can't come out. Okay. Then when you go outside, you take a look at what happened when you sit in the car or something. And oh my God, she's right. It just did that. Look at that. It just went bang. That birth of it just happened. And now I feel the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And I feel ashamed of myself. And I feel like this is me. This is who I am and all of that. Then you can go into that lesson next time. You see, because the thing that happens to the person is they sit there and they say, oh, my God, I did this again. Oh, dear. You know, and then they say what happens is like with panic attacks, it's not the panic attack we look at. It's the panic attack and the and the and the. Uh, mm, uh, the result, the cause, what happens from the panic attack is they turn around, they say, oh, this is me. This is who I am. This is myself. This is all my fault. That's what they do with the depression also. That's where they're going. It's all me. It's mine, myself. I'm defective. I disturb other people. Everything happening here is my fault. They take the blame. Then they go on a guilt trip. And if no one helps them, then they withdraw. And if no one helps them, then they become agoraphobic and they don't come out. And they stay in their... Uh, they're delighted. Those people are delighted right now with COVID because they don't have to come out at all. And they, and they wanted to be in a position where they didn't have to come out at all, but they were struggling to force themselves to come out and work. Now we put them in their, in their um, wherever they live and told them, don't come out. It was the best thing we possibly could have done for them, except they probably ate too much and got fat. <laughs> So now they need to learn to fast. <laughs> what, what, what about people who are dealing with uh, a slightly different uh, expression, which might be that they've been subject to an intense traumatic uh, experience, which then uh, they've embodied. Um, and um, I'm, I'm mindful of one uh, of uh, um, the people we work with who has developed fairly sophisticated um, self-soothing uh, approaches when faced with very uncomfortable uh, feeling. Um, but the self-soothing maybe isn't giving uh, insight into, into the mechanism. So in that case, you teach them, you teach them the same way that the chart, okay? And you say this intense traumatic experience, it lives here. In being, it lives. In, it lives in the uh, in the reaction library, and then if they say yes, but it was this intense traumatic experience, like the taxi driver kept saying yes, but this man he did this, <laughs> and he kept telling me the story over and over and over again. Okay, well that what that man did belongs in the library, and why? Well, tell me about what that man did. When did he do it? Oh, three days ago. Oh, well, is that past? Yes. Well, tell me about the past. What does it mean? Does it mean that that event, does it have any energy left in it now, today? Well, no. Well, then how do you think that comes up right now? And then you go into the next lesson, okay? And the next lesson was about energy. And the next lesson is talking about you get one daily cup of energy per day, and that's all any human being gets for 24 hours period of time. So the question is, what are you going to do with your energy? And if each time that you give energy to this thing to wake it up, and that is what's happening, you're feeding it, and that's why it keeps happening, okay? 
So if you feed this past event, then it will keep coming up. You see, they have all different other methods of making you go back and relive the event and go into hypnosis and relive it and all that stuff, but it doesn't always necessarily work. But when you're, it depends on also who, who are you doing this with? You're doing with a, colleg a collegiate person with a, you know, a lot of knowledge about stuff. You can teach them this real easily, but you can also teach a truck driver or somebody who drove a crane very easily. And you can teach the military, even if they're infantrymen, they had to go through these tech manuals. So you have to examine the occupation of the person and what they do in their occupation to know what the approach is to teaching this person to get it across really fast. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just this process, this happening, and it's backfiring on me because I don't have enough information. So the first one was the first one was the line of cognition, how it's happening. That was the first one, okay. And the and the answer was if it's where it's bursting, the first time you go through it, it's bursting and, and you get out of there and sit somewhere and look at the fact it really did burst just the way I said it would, okay? And then you look at the chart and you say, well, it it burst from here, you know, the birth. The, the, was here and it triggered. So the question is what triggered it is coming back one more into, is coming back one step further into the library, the library of reactions, BAWA, okay? And you, you it's okay, it might be important for you in, in larger events to know more details about what this is. It might not, okay, be that important. But if they, it depends on how much they understand this. So it's sitting in a library and here's its position, you tell them. This is the event, it's called the ITE. It's the in, Intense Traumatic Experience. Okay, there it is, it sits in the library. Does it, is it alive? No. Is it past? Yes. Does it have any energy anymore in it? No. So where does the energy come from for you to see that again in your mind and get so upset on it and replay the reaction you had at the time? Where does it come from? It comes out of this picture, this picture down here that shows you you had one cup of energy and what you just did was spend over a third of it on this past thing to revive it and tell me you're reliving it, but you're not reliving it. You're actually not reliving it in the sense that you're just going through it again, like grandma sits in it. The, they sit in the rocking chair and they are rocking saying, I'm, I'm reliving what happened 10 years ago. And it's not funny. They really believe they are, okay? And then you can work with them, an elder, long enough to get them to understand, but you're not, you're using today's energy. And when this comes up, you can smile at it and say, yes, that happened, but today's energy belongs to me here today. And then they begin to understand they're in control of something. We are not taught anything in our school. It's very maddening to me. We are not taught anything in our high school health class about our mind and how it works and how all of this is operating. We have to go to somebody and trust that they know. And then they are not taught in medical school and they're not taught in college. And most of the psychology is not taught this way. See, so what are we up against? It's um, pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah. See. So, so the self-soothing as a, as a process would give just a, uh, would if you like give a chink in the door to start reflecting about the the chain of events. It's a it's a temporary thing if you are doing a system of self-soothing in something that was traumatic, but you get your chart out and you look at it intently right then and there. I carried one in a wallet for a couple of years. I had this right sitting in my wallet from the time I, well, I built it in 2005 and Bonte helped me to make sure it was right. But I um, used it with people and gave them this and said, fold it up. Now you know what it is. So fold it up and just keep it in your wallet and open it up and put it down. If some incident happens at work, you look at it and you tell me it didn't happen that way. And it does happen that way. See? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So it helps to have information, the right knowledge Absolutely. about what's actually going on, you know? Yeah. yeah.